Dr. Peter James, and welcome to the College of DuPage Entrepreneurship Club. Here we kind of partner with our guest entrepreneurs and find out how they are doing in this entrepreneurship world that we hear about that gets glamorized so much on TV. We want to hear the real deal, and today we're going to find out some of the real stuff for sure. But before I get started and do a formal introduction, Ryan, who is our distinguished president, Ryan Lawless. Ryan, good afternoon. Hey, everyone. How is it going? Uh, welcome to our second meeting of the year out of only four. So hopefully, as time goes on, we'll get more and more members to show up because it's a great club, great experience to have, getting to interact with various entrepreneurs. I know we have a great one today with uh, Justin, who is a serial entrepreneur. He's an owner of 45 Training, which I know is a very good and fast-growing fitness franchise. I want to say there's one in Naperville, in Glen Ellen, and maybe Lyle. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, but... no, you're right. You're okay, right. awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I can't wait to hear what he has to say and be sure to ask a lot of questions because I know he has a wealth of information for us. Dude, Ryan stole my thunder, man. What is that a about? Great intro. <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> what is that about? Hey, don't apologize for that. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> All right, folks, so welcome aboard. Again, my name is Peter James. Um, you are here with the Entrepreneurship Club. We are located, we usually are located on the beautiful campus of the College of DuPage, one of the largest two-year colleges in the United States located in Glen Ellen. But because we're in the middle of a pandemic, we are now coming to you from our home offices. As I mentioned earlier, Kodak, our goal is to expose students and local community members to entrepreneurs and small business owners by them sharing their story will show how entrepreneurship is definitely an option when your education is complete. And of course, we inter in interview entrepreneurs, we dive into their world and we find out how they got started and the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Yes, as Ryan mentioned, we are in episode two of our four episodes this semester. Our next episode, mark the date, mark your calendar is on November 11th. November 11th is our next episode. And then the one after that is December 2nd. So just two more, uh, lots of stuff happening on campus or with COD as it relates to entrepreneurship. For those of you who missed it, the pitch contest deadline has come and gone. There were 54 applicants for this online pitch contest. Uh, I call it pitch contest on um, pandemic edition. And um, we're gonna whittle it down to nine finalists who will be interviewed and have to do their video for November timeframe. So stay tuned for that for sure. And if you're really interested in that, stay tuned for next year for the pitch contest to make another appearance as well. But we are here today with you all here watching and listening and our special guest, of course, Justin. How are you today, sir? I'm doing uh, A-OK. -okay. Hey, okay, okay through all this. Thank you for asking. It's good. I'm glad you are safe. Hopefully you and your family are safe during 2020. Um, yeah. th thank you so much for joining us um, um, on this episode, for sure. Uh, it's great. You are actually a return. I think you're actually one of our only return guests, right? Oh, that's an honor. Yeah, <laughs> that's the case. That's sweet. <laughs> this was Saturday Night Live. We'd have to give you like a badge or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm um, excited to have you back. Um, I I'm always excited to talk to individuals about their journey, their entrepreneurship journey. And I know uh, you and I share a passion for, you know, startups and really getting momentum going for business as well. So first of all, um, let everybody know, yes, Justin is also a faculty here on campus. Justin, how long have you been teaching here on campus now? Uh, this would be my third semester. So I started in the fall semester of 2019. Nice. How is it going so far? It's good. It's good. Yeah. I, I, uh, I prefer the in-person as I'm sure most everybody else does, but uh, uh, part of that's also just me being an extrovert and sure, sure. Uh, getting energized by being around people. So, um, but it's going all right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I always tell individuals it's, um, there's nothing like that face-to-face -face interaction with students to really see them get the aha moment for sure. So that's mm -hmm. kind of kind of awesome. I do miss that for sure, but we're making the most of it under the circumstances. So not only are you a uh, faculty here on campus with uh, COD, 
but you do a little bit of stuff outside of Canvas. So give us a little sneak peek into that before I start diving into the questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> I feel like I do a lot of stuff outside. <laughs> All right. Too, too much. Um, when I was on here uh, last year, I was doing a, uh, a software startup focused on, on the enterprise. And um, I'm, not, I'm not involved in that, that business anymore. Uh, we really kind of paused on that. Um, and that's a, a whole other story. And, and it's interesting and, and while di all disappointing when startups aren't working out, um, there's a lot of really cool things and positive stuff that comes from it. But right now, my business is that involves is, is called F45 Training. And um, we're a fitness uh, franchise. And, and so that's been one of my things is what would normally be just kind of a, a plug and play business uh, of that's both half job, so to speak, half investment, um, has really turned into like a full on entrepreneur type role because 2020 has, has thrown every industry uh, on its heels. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out just like everybody else. And those who are willing to take risks and, and do them smart are going to be a okay. Yeah, so thanks for uh, sharing that. I want to dive into how that's going, especially in light of this pandemic that we're in, for sure. But I want to I want to go back a little bit into mm -hmm. this entrepreneurial ups and downs of the roller coaster, as I like to call it. Yeah. And, um, and have you chat a little bit about what you experienced? If hopefully you don't mind going into a little bit of what you experienced from the entrepreneurship. Um, realm and with your previous business and some of the challenges maybe that you were up against because a lot of times you know the textbooks they don't do us any service as it relates to business or entrepreneurship uh, actually really doing it is what you see so what were you able to experience as you were launching a, a, a business you know it comes down to really two things that's going to make or break something being successful and that's both um time and money in terms of, of being finite resources within there. And, and so, you know, that's been the biggest impact on, on both, you know, of businesses that I've, that I've been a part of in terms of, of starting up on my own. And, and those limitations have really put the constraints on it. So like a software startup, um, we got some seed funding. And so what that gave us a runway. And by the time that runway is out, you're either just going to be successful and either exit or get another investment, or you're going to have to shut down the business and go on and go on to something else. With this right now, um, uh, you know, in terms of going into a franchise environment, um, you know, there's typically a lot more runway. Um, time is less of a constraint um, as far as those things go. Um, but 2020 is, has been an absolute nightmare on that. For instance, I was supposed to open my doors April 9th um, for my big wow. brand opening. And just, so if we recall, um, we were getting shut down. And at that time, we were all thinking, oh, this shutdown could be for weeks. Right. <laughs> and we're, what, seven months in and, and there's no end in sight. And so right. it, it, we're, where the books are not really talking about is like, you know, really, where do you spend money? Where do you t spend your time? Where do you not? It's just as important in terms of those things. And that doesn't always get, you know, discussed in terms of uh, textbooks. Yeah. Yeah. That this pandemic thing is just totally, I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. interested in, um, in this franchise. I have to admit, um, I have not always been a franchise guy. I had a bad taste in my mouth about them, but the older I get, I think I'm starting to see some light there and I'm like, Oh, so I'm really, I'm going to be uh, pegging you a little bit as well. One more question about the past. Um, Mm -hmm. based on what you've experienced as, as students or individuals may approach you in the future about, you know, them doing it, them getting the seed money or some funding from investors or loans or for that matter, you know, what are some tips? Um, what are some, some stuff that you will warn them about as they're venturing down that path of um, new business ownership or startup for that matter? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if we're talking like true startup and a startup for me is somebody who's creating something new from scratch, right? There's, there's some innovation uh, in a sense to it. Who you get your money from matters as much as how much you get it from, mm. uh, how much you get from them. And, and really a prime example of that is um, there's a reason that certain venture capitalists and financiers have specializations in certain things. Like if let's like tech, for instance, because they know the nuance of how long it takes for something to, to get developed um, and then the ins and outs of that product 
And then as and then the, the other side of it is not just the operations piece of it, then oftentimes they've got connections where they can open doors. So if you're trying to get a beta customer, for example, there's some they've got a Rolodex or you know a contacts list where they can call up and be like, hey, Peter's got a great new idea out here and he needs somebody to test it. Would you be that guinea pig for him? Because uh, those first few customers are the hardest. The first few customers, the first million, all of the firsts are the hardest that you're ever going to have. And so that's for me is just the, the who, who you bring into your team, whether it's a financier or anything like that is, is absolutely critical. That's interesting. I would never have thought about it from that perspective, um, the, about even from a perspective of, yes, yeah, someone wants to come invest in your startup, mm -hmm. but you really need to pay attention into what are the, what are the um, resources that they're bringing in besides money? What are, the, what are their value to the, your business overall? And that's what I'm hearing you say. Hey, absolutely, because money is infinite. You can get it from anywhere, um, theoretically. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to do a green company, mm. um, you know, and something pro-environment, whatever that is, then getting from somebody who's got contacts and resources as it relates to that type of, of industry and segment, that is the person you should go with and not somebody who's really big into oil, not somebody who's really big mm. into... Um, um groceries or you know what have you it's just you know it's it's the who is is a really big deal and another way to say it and what i'm hearing you say is all money is not good money yeah yeah exactly that's a great way to say it. interesting interesting so that's interesting you know as i know a lot of us when someone offers us some money we're like quick to grab it but what comes along with that you have to really ask yourself I'll, okay. I'll give you I'll give you a specific example. There's a mm -hmm. company called um, Avodox, and they yeah. are a tech startup for legal matters. They help with like create legal papers. And they joined an incubator out of New Jersey, New York area called Y Combinator. It's one of the most famous incubators out there. Yeah. yeah. For one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I think, in seed money, Y Combinator gets seven percent of your of your company's equity. Huh. And that's a lot. They don't tell you that upfront. They don't tell you that upfront. Yeah. But the CEO that said he would do it all day again and again, if he ever did in our startup, because Y Combinator can open doors to anybody anywhere in Silicon Valley. And they got mm -hmm. so much traction out of just be for six months out of just being a part of Y Combinator that it more than paid for itself. Huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Again, you don't, you don't hear about, you, you don't hear or think about that type of stuff on the surface by any means. So very, very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Hey folks, those of you who are with us today, again, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I don't want to be the only one asking questions. So if you have a question, please feel free to drop, drop it in the chat. Um, I highly encourage you to ask questions um, as, as, uh, Justin here has a, um, a wealth of experience from a startup and even a franchise perspective, which we're getting ready to dive into. So please don't be a stranger. Jump on in with any types of questions for us relative to entrepreneurship. So, so Justin, you may, you pivoted a little bit. You pivoted. Uh, so let's, before we even dive into F45, what was the pivot like going from that startup to the franchise model? Well, what went into that a little bit? Um, completely different goal coming out of that. Yeah. For the startup, I was quite literally just trying to solve a problem. And, um, and I thought I had something great to, to do and it just, it hasn't worked out yet. Um, the team and I, we still talk we, all the time about who's got the next thing. So um, that's all good there. Um, the franchise pieces from an entrepreneur's perspective was more about an investment. So um, before this conversation, I talked a little bit about what I like to teach in class, and it's a bit of how the world works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most millionaires have seven income streams, right? And, and oh, you, so, gotta say, you gotta say that again for everybody to hear for sure. Yeah, yeah. most millionaires have at least seven income streams. So that's a job, stocks, dividends, um, they're selling royalties to something. I mean, you name it, there's real estate. Variety. What's yeah. that? Real, I said real estate. Real estate, yes, thank you. Real estate's an, another great one. Um, so for me, only thing I had income was just my retirement accounts and some investments that I had had, like in the stocks and then my jobs. And so for me, I, was, I wanted to start to build what would eventually be multiple income streams. And this was one of them. And so people get into franchises for either one of two reasons. They're either 
um, looking to just get out of corporate or they want to be their own boss and maybe they don't have that that light bulb idea that's going to change the world that's cool they just want to basically own a business and let somebody else do a bunch of the dirty work to get off the ground and it's all good so it's a it's like a job thing it's like a secure job thing the other piece of it is the investor portion of it that looks at more like a a cash flow statement, a, a P&L, if you're familiar with finance, a profit and loss statement. So basically they're looking at it as an asset that they're either getting money on a regular basis or they're going to build it up and sell it mm. at some period of time. And that's how I looked at this. And so for me, it's in the highest growing area in fitness. Um, and uh, I've been in the fitness industry for the past five years uh, doing product development for one of the largest manufacturers out there. And so um, this seemed like a really good spot for me to to take my knowledge and insights and, and apply it into that. And then and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Good, yeah, ready to dive into that. But we have a question from our audience, someone by the name of SpeedNef20. I don't think that's the real name for sure, but they asked, they've kind of gone a little, it's Muhammad. Okay. Muhammad, how are you? Um, they've gone a little bit left on us a little bit, but that's okay. What's your take on drop shipping, especially Amazon drop shipping business? It's a little bit um, out of the ordinary, but Hey, interested in your thoughts there, um, Justin. Yeah, this gets, you know, yeah, this, this is a, a nice safe thing uh, theoretically to do in terms of, of low risk. There's a ton of competition out there. So I think it's really hard to, to do it well. Um, it's a bit formulaic. So I think it all comes down to is, um, um, can you, uh, find the right products? that's going to do really well, high profit, either high ticket, high dollar amount or low ticket, low dollar amount, you know, so it's a volume play or not. Um, the thing I always caution people on there is I, I think there's a lot of, if we look kind of like our phones, if you're on Instagram and stuff, there's a lot of, um, um, sexiness thrown towards being your own boss and doing a drop ship business. Um, I, I think it's a lot more glamorized than, than it really is. And so it's, it's a, it's a tough, tough game out there. And the thing is, is if you're, if you're doing really well, Amazon's just going to say, they're either going to block you out of the store or they're just going to create their own product for it. And then they're just going to cut you out. So it's not a forever business for, for people. Yeah. Just, I love how you said, um, it's it's glamorized and it's um it's a low risk easy entry type of business so anybody can jump into to drop shipping and usually when something is like that it means it's harder to make money a lot of money like that so i have a i've had dreams of drop shipping watches i'm a watch guy nice. i've had dreams of doing that for years yeah um, I, I, but i think so many people are doing that um, and I don't have the time and the effort to be able to put into that. And so it just doesn't make any sense for me. I'm hoping somebody out there would do that because I might want to buy some watches from them. But, um, but yeah, it's um, something to think about from Amazon or even for anybody for that matter. It's really um, important to look at what is their risk reward to a certain extent. Yeah. Good stuff. We have another question for you, um, Justin, um, about business planning. Ooh, this is a this is a funny subject here. I was just talking to somebody yesterday. I did a presentation on business plans yesterday. What are what's some advice you have for developing a business plan? Um, I mean, who's your audience for? Is it if you're you're gonna need a pretty good one if you're going to a bank to ask for money? If it's if you don't need to go to a bank and you're just doing your own, I think it's just more of a guide. Um, to formulate thoughts. Um, so I think it, I think it all depends on who, who that is. My biggest thing when, when we're coming down into um, putting together a business plan is, is who is your target customer? Who's, who's your target segment within there? Because that is going to make or break everything. Pricing, the product selected, the service selected, um, you know, how you're going to deliver that to that end, end customer. Um, you can't be all things to all people and you got to, you got to hone in on something. And that's, that's one of the harder things to do. Yeah. I'll add to that. It is, um, can be challenging. Um, but, uh, those of you who are really into this starting a business thing, a business plan doesn't have to be as daunting unless of course you are looking for investments or a loan. So your investor or the bank mm -hmm. is going to want to see, all the details you can give them about how you're going to be successful and why you're going to be successful. So just think about if you were investing in my business, you would want to know everything about it before you gave me a dollar. 
you want to know, hey, what's my return? What's the chances I'm going to get a score, a big, a lot of, a lot of money? If there's not a chance, you're not going to give me any money. So now I have to give you a packet that shows you my history, um, what the market looks like, what the co competition looks like, the com customers are looking like, all those details in a business plan. Now, mind you, if you're not trying to get a loan, if you're not trying to get um, investors, then you could probably start a, get a, do a smaller business plan like the business model canvas or a one page business plan that you can Google out there a whole lot. But I, rec I do recommend, like Justin mentioned, I do recommend some type of plan to get the momentum rolling a little bit. Yeah, there's some great tools out there. Uh, value proposition design is another one to Google. Um, there's some canvases and frameworks for that. There's some awesome, awesome things that tools that are out there to help kind of formulate those thoughts. Some good stuff. Good questions. Folks. We've got some questions rolling in today, Justin. I don't know. It's you, it's you man. You're, you're bringing in all the hot, you're bringing in the heat, man. bringing in the heat. We've got a question from Christine Kickles, another educator here on campus. How did your college, this is a two part question. How did your college education prepare you to be an entrepreneur? And was there a particular experience or class that still has had an impact on you today? Um, college, like if we look strictly from it, like undergraduate, that's in engineering for me. Hmm. Um, so that was like engineering is basically a glorified word, word for saying problem solving. So um, I, uh, I would just say that kind of made me decent at, at math or at least those kinds of, of subjects of, of that kind of stuff, like analytical things. Uh, but my, I got an MBA um, as well. And um, that was the best decision that I ever made, both in terms of getting the academic background um, but it really uh, solidified a lot of other like experiences that I was looking to validate and desire and, and kind of goals that I was looking to validate is for me that kind of first time uh, academics felt like there's that true fit. And it was not just like getting an MBA, but finding the right school for me. That was a, that was a good fit for me. So, um, and then when I got there in that one, I, I immersed myself uh, 110% into it, which I did not do in my undergrad. I did not do in high school. Um, so that kind of like just got really just kind of momentum built and I've continued to thrive off that momentum ever since then. Good stuff. Um, yes, folks, you heard him say math. Math is going to be beneficial for you when you become an entrepreneur. So thank you so much for that question, Christine. Um, I would even say that, uh, you know, I always tell people that the great thing about college, it helps round you out a little bit because all the myriad of different classes that you take, you may not have taken, you may not take in under any other circumstances. So you wouldn't take philosophy or theology or sociology if it was left up to you alone. And some of the stuff that you learn there helps to round you out as an individual and perhaps even um, dictate um, the, the career path to a certain extent as well. Sure so, does. Um, so good stuff. So let's, hey, let's pivot again there. Just excited now to dive into this franchise thing as well. So, um, and especially from the fitness perspective, because I go to um, LA, LA Fitness and uh, I know the guy who, who opened it and it's fascinated me now, man. I'm like, I can do this. I can do that too, man. So, so tell me um, how that process was, even from the get-go looking at um, a franchise model such as F45 and maybe even deciding that you want to move forward. Hey, lastly too, I want to um, talk about your team. I heard you mention that a little bit. So I know you have, um, you collaborate, you got people around you and maybe even talk about the importance of that too. Yeah. Um, and would you like to know kind of like how I picked F45 or what do you? Yeah, what went, in, what went into that? Why did you, um, you know, how did you even know that F45 was going to be your thing and not Anytime Fitness? So for me, in developing products for the fitness industry, um, I had a ton of data on it. And so like, okay, Ibis World, uh, which is a database that you can get uh, from the library here. Yep. Christine Kickles and I collaborate on accessing and teaching on these databases all the time. And I highly recommend you work with her and, and, uh, and get some knowledge on that because it's super valuable. Some of the data that we have at the COD library, I paid $20,000 for at Life Fitness to get insights into the global fitness market. And that's just one report. And it was a segment, of, like a small portion of it. So basically companies pay tons of money to, to get all this data on where the trends are at. And one of the trends that I that was seeing is basically there's only growth in the budget in the fitness industry out there. So Planet Fitness. Mm -hmm. 
ten dollars a month, that kind of stuff. There's only growth in like high end, so boutiques like Orange Theory at forty five, and then like full of like Equinox, Midtown Athletic Club, that kind of stuff. The mid tier is dying and has been dying. So anybody in that was segment, I'm like, ah, oh, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. And so then you start to look at what those upfront costs are. So you look at people who are investing in in these big behemoth gyms that you kind of mentioned before. That's million dollars of just equipment alone. Forget the build out, the lease, all those types of things. Whereas the boutique, what's beautiful about those is it's a fraction of that cost, and it's still a chunk of change. But you can get to um, in the black, you know, cash flow positive of pretty quick, and you can scale up to to multiple sites and things along those lines. So that led me down the path to at least explore it. Um, uh, going into that. And then from there, it was trying to find something where I could theoretically get in on the ground floor, uh, meaning, you know, it's not sold out and things along those lines, because franchises has typically sold like territories, mm-hmm. you know, to prevent cannibalization and, and competing with, with each other. Yeah, good stuff. What is it like, you know, so I think what, what has happened to me before, historically, you know, as from an entrepreneurship perspective, I almost looked at the franchise model as just, I might as well work for somebody. Um, what is it like having a parent organization headquarters who is the, the franchisor um, being over you as the franchisee? How, how, how is that experience from your perspective? If you, if you vet, because you're both getting vetted, you, I mean, you're essentially applying in to be a part of it, and, 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 but you're also selecting whether or not you want to even go with them. Sure. If you're into what they're offering and how they do it, then it probably won't be an issue because you've, you've already decided that up, up front. Um, so, so being wise and selective is, is really helpful within there. Um, yeah, you have a lot less freedom um, on an ongoing basis, but the cool part is, is like, you didn't have to spend all that time and effort designing the product, mm-hmm. developing the marketing, building up the brand. I mean, like that's all been done for you. And so, you know, if you come out from that perspective, then, then, you know, you're, you're looking more like a partnership than you are as far as like oversight. Yeah. It's funny because um, I, get, I get a subscription to Entrepreneur Magazine and towards the end of the magazine, they always talk about the franchises. I used to skip over it. I used to be like, I'm done with this magazine. Now I'm all into it, looking at the top 100 franchises in the country or in the world for that matter as well and seeing how profitable they are, what it takes yeah. to get involved. So it's all interesting, right? Yeah, I mean, I have, I would, ne- I wouldn't, I don't, I don't like the idea of franchising food as just a consumer because mm-hmm. I want every town to have its own unique food experience. Sure. But I personally don't care about that from a fitness perspective. So I would never open up. Like I have a friend who opened two or three Culvers and he's loving it. Yeah. But I wouldn't go that route. So, but that's it. They they say the most profitable food franchise is, and I don't know if they're open to the public, general public anymore. Is our Chick Fil A? Yeah, and they, you know, you, you can't drive by one without seeing a line, you know, wrapped around their two, their two lane. They have uh, really doctors. strict restrictions. You get a salary. You only get a certain percentage of equity in that store that you own. That you don't get a hundred percent. I mean, like, it's a different. They have a different model. They have a lot more control. Yeah, they do. They really, really do. Um, good stuff. Um, I want to still talk some more about this. We got Muhammad saying, "Hey, he's actually going back to the COD uh, education thing um, about and talking about the entrepreneur certificate. Is it a good for gaining knowledge?" Um, and then um, Veronica even goes on to say, "Talk about COD certificate programs are a great great way to learn the important important basics of an industry." I think the certificates. I'm going to just speak. Um, from a bias perspective there, Muhammad, I think the certificates are a great, great way to get some deeper dive learning in the field that you're looking at. Um, and that that may allow you to flourish a little bit more. So don't get me wrong. It doesn't guarantee anything for you in life. You still got to put in the effort, um, have that network, all that kind of good stuff. But it just gives you a little bit more insight than most people will have for sure. Um, any take on certificates at all there from your perspective, Justin? Uh, I mean, it always lends credibility into that, whether you're, you're um, speaking to an investor, uh, speaking to a bank, things along those lines and say like, hey, I'm dotting my I's, crossing my T's. I mean, just forget what you said alone to just like doing it for your own benefit. You know, there's some benefit from, from an external perspective too. 
Awesome, awesome. So hopefully that gave you that perspective there, uh, Muhammad, even just from a theoretical perspective as well. So let's jump back into F45, man. So um, you did your research, you you vetted their headquarters and the franchise, or you felt comfortable doing that. What was the process like from start to finish from the paperwork perspective? What was that like from a fr- uh, for the franchise? Yeah, so in a franchise, they give you what's called a, a, a franchise disclosure de- uh, document, the FDD, and it's a legal requirement for them from a, uh, the government perspective mm-hmm. that they have to disclose everything of not only where their headquarters are and how they market and how much things cost to invest in the business, but if there's lawsuits against them, and if so, by who and for what. And it, gets, it, it opens up, it, goes, it takes you behind the curtains to every, every detail. And again, it's a legal, legal mandated document. So going through those is, is what you do in great detail before you sign any contract with, uh, with any franchise or so that you know exactly what, what you're getting into. And, and then from then, it's getting rolling and, and starting to find a home for your business and trying to get executed on that. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, I, I know it's a lot of paperwork. I'm, hope, I'm assuming, of course, that you had a lawyer to comb through it all with a fine tooth comb, that is, to make sure that you knew exactly what you were walking into, correct? Yeah. Yes. And, and that's, that's one of the things, too, is not just any lawyer, but a lawyer that specializes in this type of stuff. You know, lawyers, we see them on TV, and like if you watch Suits, they're doing everything from managing contracts for NBA players to patent disputes to, you know, all sorts of stuff. And like a lawyer typically just does one thing and one thing really well. I do real estate. I do patents. I do like, I do franchises. So you got to find one that's an expert in that thing. So what I'm hearing you say there, uh, Justin, is that don't find a, I do everything type of lawyer. No way. (laughs) No way. I would never, I would never trust that person. (laughs) Interesting. Good stuff. Unless they're a savant. But yeah, I wouldn't. (laughs) I don't think I would do that. I don't think no. I would do it at all. Um, so the paperwork, you, you had to sign it. Uh, you had to go through and do all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. What about researching locations? Um, um, was it Ryan at the beginning talked about he knows of a few locations in the area already. What went into that type of research also? Yeah, that has been the biggest biggest nightmare of the whole, the whole experience actually going into it outside of, of a pandemic hitting. Uh, that was the, the most, you know, eye-opening thing for me is commercial real estate is is the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, I just hate it, <laughs> and 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 uh, and the reason being is um, unless it's a massive square foot, they don't put their best people uh, from a landlord or commercial uh, broker perspective on that. Um, there's a lot of dishonesty. Uh, for instance, I had I had three places where I'm going in to sign the loan. And, and, or the lease and them telling me that uh, I'm the only one bidding on it. And at the last second, they're like, oh, somebody else not only is bidding, but they, we gave it to them. And uh, like, they'll just lie through their teeth. And, and I talked to, you know, people in the industry and they're like, yeah, that's just what happens. And so I, I had no idea. And so for me, what I thought would be a few months it took well over a year in terms of finding a space. And, and that was a huge, huge headache. And, uh, it's been something that, that for me, I'll, I'll always kind of steer people towards uh, being really wise and what they expect from, the, from that perspective there. That's interesting. Um, I am somewhat familiar with the commercial real estate industry. And yes, I am seeing that more and more for sure. It is, um, it's very, very interesting for sure. Um, so uh, let's, so you, decide, you decided you finally got the lease, you finally got a place. Yep. Made the decision to open. I guess you had to build up to get mm-hmm. equipment, so all that kind of good stuff as well. You made a decision to open. What went into that date for sure, that launch date? Uh, fast as you can do it. I mean, so for me, trying to line up everything towards peaks and of, of the, you know, like summer's a, a lull in terms of, of people getting into the gym. Um, you know, so just trying to go in terms of when, when the trends would be within there. But um, yeah, we would have been okay if the pandemic wouldn't have hit, you know, we did, we do a pre-sale, uh, to get basically have revenue and waiting for when the doors open mm-hmm. and we had a bunch of people ready to rock and, and, you know, all of a sudden the pandemic hit. So that part's been really, really detrimental to the business. Yeah. So, so you, did I hear you say you launched in April or had you already been in business up until that time? No, we were supposed to uh, officially open doors. We were supposed to open doors in January, but that got pushed back for construction a little bit. But that's that's normal. Things pop up within there for you know 30, 60 days. 
Um, so yeah, we were ready to rock and then, and then the pandemic hit and we weren't allowed to open for quite some time. And so we eventually officially opened in August, but we pivoted to online, um, in the interim and, and, um, it, it, it trickled in, but you know, was not nearly what, uh, what we could have been doing elsewhere with, with an in-studio experience, the core product really. Yeah. And how, and how has it even evolved in light of the pandemic? How, um, are people coming back out? Obviously, Illinois has opened up gyms again. Are you seeing now a little influx of people coming in to where you are? Yeah. And so um, those who would be like diehard and loyal to this type of product have become even more so mm -hmm. rabid fans of it, um, not just of this brand, but just this type of, of experience because they want to get out of the house or um, they can't work out on their home or um, they're afraid of gaining weight and, you know, because that does tie into the healthiness of, of people staying. So, um, you know, that, that part's been really nice, but it's definitely shrunk the overall pool in the short term of access to, to customers. Interesting. Yeah. And then I guess also from a competition perspective, because now you're vying for those customers who are just want to get to a gym and, and now the competition is also going after those individuals as well. Speaking of that, who is the target market for F45? Who is the type of individual that you guys go after? Um, women, the high market to women, 25 to 55. Mm -hmm. Ideally, an average household income of $75,000 per year or more. Mm -hmm. um, and then where it gets probably the most broad is um, uh, any fitness level, but I, uh, I typically am not marketing to, to novices. So somebody who's, who's either in what I'll call maintenance mode or trying to be straight up an athlete or get you know, in great, really great shape. Yep. Um, so those of you who are listening and watching, of course, um, you, when you start out, start your business, it's important to really niche your, your target market for sure and understand who you're going after, at going after in the beginning, you, everyone is not your customer. It's important that you really fine tune your target so that you can get the momentum going for sure. And Justin just here really provided some insight in there. So thank you so much for that, Justin, as well. Yep. We're, 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 yeah. I want to I want you to plug the uh, business. Where are you guys located? If you mind me saying. So Ask we're on like the border of Elk Grove Village and Itasca. Cool. So we're we're right up there. But yeah, there's Glen there's one in Glen Ellen, Lyle, Naperville, Downers Grove, Oak Brook. Uh, they're they're uh, downtown. There's they're all over. So does that factor into the competition thing from you guys? Does it have to be a certain radius? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. About a five mile radius is is kind of where we're gonna at least get his that tight. That's about it. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Hey folks, I don't want to hog all the questions. I got like two more questions to ask them as we wrap up, but I want to make sure that everyone who is watching is able to ask the questions that they have. We've got quite a few folks in the queue as participants. I want to make sure that you are being heard. So please don't hesitate to type your question into the chat so that Justin can get your question because you never know. You might be a franchisee one of these days and he's got all the information for you, all the secrets he's got. For you. <laughs> I like it. Hey, as, we, as, we, as we wait for those people to um, ask questions, um, talk a little bit about um, your team, your circle. Who do you surround yourself with that is allowing you to make clear decisions? Yeah, so um, it's everything from as close as my wife, who's a marketing guru and a PR, even more so a PR expert. So as we run into all sorts of issues with things and how to communicate, whether it's to our membership base or to the, the greater the greater market, she's she's my right hand person. And then um, I've got entrepreneurs that I that I work with, um, and they're anything from a pep talk to uh, you know tangible concrete uh, advice and skill set. Uh, right out here, out of Innovation to Page is actually where I, I met him. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, and then there's there's folks that I've pulled in al along the way throughout my career, um, and then um, you know I've got a phenomenal lawyer uh, that I've got um, for real estate. Uh, he's pretty badass actually. Um, and you then, might have to share uh, him with me. You might have to share that one with me. Hey, I, I will. He's 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 worth every penny. He's great. <laughs> and then uh, um. And then for me, it's, it's, um, there's some other F45 franchisees, franchise over. And so, you know, not some of them are, are fantastic and some of them are garbage. 
So just don't even bother with the ones that are garbage. And then I lean on, we, we lean on each other for the ones that are really good. That is one of the benefits about being in a franchise ecosystem is that there's, there's some like, not even like-minded, but more uh, shared vision and shared goals cool. with folks that, uh, that I lean on as well. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah. It's very good insight overall into this franchise thing. You give me even a new perspective for that as well. Hey, any questions from our audience? Still want to make sure that I don't hog the last couple ones here for sure. So yeah, you talked about uh, your team, who you surround yourself with a little bit. What about maybe a, a personal habit? You know, people always ask, hey, what do you do every day to, that gives you success? What is it maybe a personal habit that you know has worked for you as you um, have become successful in life? I don't know if it's a habit, but like a um, kind of a mindset of just getting in and doing it. I uh, uh, sometimes it's it's boded really well for me that I'm just willing to just jump in with both feet and try something. Mm -hmm. um, other times it sets me up for failure, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh, I'm perfectly fine with with kind of living and learning. Um, so that is definitely something um, that it is. I, I think for me, it, as far as more of a habit, it is just kind of like um, making sure there's a continuous learning uh, experience going on, whether it's books, audio books, um, finding online classes, things along those like, there's always something to learn. And, and for instance, is, um, uh, I didn't like a marketing agency that we had, had hired and, and uh, I didn't know who else to pick. So I just taught myself how to do digital marketing uh, for a couple of months. And I don't, I decided I don't wanna do it myself long term. It's a lot of heavy lifting, but now I know exactly how to vet an agency better because I, I at least did it for for a time and now I'm, a, I'm just a more educated buyer yeah yeah i did that um with real estate i um was my own landlord for a while so that when i ultimately hire a property manager i know when they're trying to pull the wool over my eyes a little bit so stuff like that and um is very very beneficial as well um antonio asks when it comes to a tech corporation, do you think it's beneficial to franchise or not to franchise a tech company? Hmm. I don't know. That it depends on depends on how you define tech. I think in the true word of what we think of, of true tech, no. Um, but if there's a company that's that's really based on technology, like F45 is very technology centric. Mm -hmm. um, there's nine TVs um, in the studio, and they each have a dedicated thing, and they're not broadcasting sports center they are actually helping you with your in their in-studio workout experience in one in one way or another um so i um you know I, I think from a tech perspective you know that's something that's good but as far as like a true tech company so i i'd have to say i don't i'm surely sure i understand the question but i would say to not franchise based on how, what i think you're asking yeah the only tech companies that i know about are um like the coding education ones you know, that really are, are doing yeah. a little, trying to get people, pull people in to learn coding a little bit more. Those are the only IT or tech type companies that I really am aware of. So I don't know what else may be out there that I'm just not aware of. So right. it could very well be something that I'm not. So good question. Thank you so much for answering, asking that question. So um, Justin, last question I got for you. And um, folks, thank you so much for staying with us. Good insight, great insight into this whole entrepreneurship game, especially from the franchise perspective. If you were in college, if you had to do this all over again there, Justin, knowing then what you know now, what would you do differently, you know, going if you had to go back? Yeah, I would have picked one of the many ideas that I've had over the years and just <laughs> done it. <laughs> just done it. Done, it. Yeah, done it earlier. Yeah, way earlier. Um, I've got two kids at home and, and all that, and, and it's all good. Um, I think there's a lot of, of hype around entrepreneurs are working 24 seven and, you know, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I honestly think that's both idiotic. You need, we all need rest, but then also I don't think you work any more than a corporate job. Like you work at any major corporation, especially if you've got like some certain bosses and we all have at some point, they're asking to get on your laptop at nine o'clock and respond to emails and things like that. And so it's no different than running your own thing. So I wish I would have just done it earlier. I, look, I'm only laughing because I think I've said that phrase a couple of times. I'll sleep uh, when I'm dead, Jerry Joseph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, it's interesting insight. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And I think that speaks to all of our students who may be watching this or listening later on as well. Listen, if you have an idea, there's no time like the present to get the momentum going with it because you don't know what five years from now is going to look like. You don't know what two years from now is going to look like. And you don't, definitely. And, and I will tell you, you know, you think you don't have any money to do it right now. You won't, who says you're going to have it? Yeah, and you don't, and you don't need a finished product or service to test whether it's going to be successful or not. It, it can be very no frills and, and people will tell you if you got something there, if you don't. Yeah. Good stuff. Good insight. Hey, Justin, thank you so much for joining us once again at the Codex show here. We are episode two of the spring semester. Let's give them a quick silent hand of applause, <laughs> uh, round of applause. Of course, I'm the only one that you could hear for sure as well. Hey, we'll hang out a little bit, folks, if you have any further questions. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I will, um, I'm going to share my other screen here just so everybody can see the flyer for subsequent meetings coming up. Sharing, this This is always escapes me with um, with the Zoom here. So just everybody can see, this is the flyer for the next meeting coming up. November 11th is the next meeting. So please make sure that you mark your calendar, same time, same channels. Okay, stop, share. I gotta talk my way through this because I'll mess something up and shut everybody down. The other thing is folks, um, if, um, actually Ryan, before I go, do any any housekeeping notes at all? I know I got to talk about the emails, but any anything I'm forgetting, Ryan? Um, currently, I can't think of too much. It was a really great interview, and it was really great to hear Justin speak. Um, the only thing I can think of is we still have openings available for officer positions. We can always use any sort of help we can or any ideas that you guys want to give to us about what we can improve or change going forward or what sort of activities we might have like if we want to do sort of breakout rooms and discuss things in groups yeah we can try that out sometime but we'd love to hear some feedback and we'd love to have some more officers to help us out in the future absolutely hey folks yeah um, right put your email in the um chat too hey, if you are interested yeah in for sure being a part of this truly phenomenal experience and have some great ideas please don't hesitate to reach out to Ryan. He'd love to have, have you, um, love to talk with you as well. If you are, have, are one of a student, uh, one of my students or a student who may be getting extra credit as a result of being here, I'm asking you all to please put your email in the chat. Put your email in the chat and let us know that you are here so I can let your teachers know that you are here or whoever you need to know, um, who needs to know that you're here, please do that as well. Um, okay, so we got some questions coming in last minute. Um, yeah, um, Justin says use those databases. They are well. I put the, I put a link for the databases in there. If you have not dove into the COD databases for a number of different reasons, definitely do so to research a business that you may be interested in. It's free to all yep. students, um, and it's it's a wealth of information that costs a ton of money outside of campus for sure. Updates on the pitch contest. Yes, they have, um, there were 54 applicants. If you applied, stand by, you will be notified probably within the next 24, 48 hours. Um, yes, they, they have chosen the nine finalists. So stay tuned, stay by your email. Someone will reach out to you very soon to let you know if you have made the final round or if you have not. So stand by for that. Thank you so much for asking that question. Again, if you are a student and you need this as extra credit, please put your email in the chat so that we can make sure that we get that communicated to the people who need to, to communicate. Um, don't forget to check us out on YouTube, on the COD uh, web COD channel. There's a Codec channel in the COD channel as well. Next episode is November 11th. Mm -hmm.